things in your life are not having to do with how smart you are, how much of an education you have, how long it takes you to figure out a situation, how, long, how easily you can tell the distance from the next car while you're driving, because you did all this projectile motion and all the other things they were talking about. I just remember projectile, I failed physics, so <laughs> apparently, apparently if you throw something, it's projectile. So anyway, so the point is, in life, the challenges for you are gonna be slightly different. For most Pakistanis, remember what Imran Khan says, and it's really important. 43% of all Pakistanis are suffering from stunting. Anybody know what that means? It's, it's stunting is mal malnutrition. So your body does I was not a nerd, so I, I, I you know, I, I'm like the guy on the motorbike. So, what are these conflicts? I have a cheat sheet so I can make sure that I don't tell you the wrong, the wrong conflict. The first one, and the one that I found difficult when I was growing up, because I was lying, I was a little bit of a nerd, but the, but the first conflict most smart kids in this culture will have is what they want you to do versus what you want to do. And we're not talking about like what, what's happening on Tuesday evening, right? We're talking about what you want to do in your life, right? So most of you are good at math, most of you are good at math. I'm guessing most of you are good at math, right? So if you're good at math, we're in the fourth industrial revolution. Anybody heard of this term, fourth industrial revolution? Yeah. Right? So you've heard of data science, mm -hmm. analytics, mm -hmm. computer science, algorithms, numbers. So it'll be really easy. You'll graduate from whatever whatever you do, science portal, history portal, quiz portal, when you graduate, you will have an opportunity to work in a software firm or a bank or any kind of a profession that allows you to play with numbers. And the thing about it is that it will offer you a good salary and it will offer you a respectable stature, and potentially it will offer you a decent vista. And for all those reasons, they, mom, dad, cousin, sister, friend, TV, WhatsApp, Facebook, likes, whatever it is that makes you do stuff that isn't you, those things are gonna push you in that direction. And so you have to figure out what, direc what direction you wanna go in. And it could be the same thing. There is nothing wrong with a nice, ordinary, but privileged, comfortable life. So don't let anybody, if that's what you want, don't let anybody tell you that's not good enough. But if I was your dad, and I'm not, but if I was, I'd say, if you're this smart, you guys shouldn't be the ones doing the data science, sitting there typing numbers and figuring out stuff. You guys shouldn't even be the ones writing the algorithms. That's almost for second-rate dumb people. I mean, nerds, but not quality nerds. <laughs> you guys should be the ones figuring out what the fifth industrial revolution will be. Listen to me. It's too easy in this country, in this environment, LUMS, mainstream, everything. Let's just go and get a decent job. So let's go, let's go to LUMS. Let's do computer science. Let's get a job at Microsoft. Let's move to? Yeah. Or something like that. Microsoft is in, uh, is in Washington State, I think. Seattle. Redmond? No. No, no, no. What's the headquarters for Microsoft? Thank God, I'm glad you don't know. That means that I, A, either I'm too old and my references are dated or, or you guys aren't interested in, in, in sort of the tech world. Do whatever you want, but if you end up doing something that's ordinary, where you're just punching a clock and doing what another 10,000 people are doing in that, in that office complex, you probably, please don't hold, hold me to this, but you probably chose wrong somewhere, right? Because I think when you're this privileged, and this smart, and this talented, you should be looking at, at being a game changer, not at playing the game well. You, you understand? So it's not like, you know, you're a cricketer and you're going to make a century by century. That's fine. But changing the game is that you're a coach who figures out, actually, how to bowl differently because of the mechanics or the quantum physics of the way the arm comes down. Be that guy. Be the guy that figures out how you changed the actual feel that everybody's playing on. Don't be one of the players. So the conflict is uh, you and your specific ambitions versus them. And them is everybody except you. <coughs> That's the first conflict. The second conflict, and I've already alluded to it, is that uh, you know we come from a country that's been through a lot. And uh, it's a country that uh, didn't exist a uh, hundred years ago, even the word Pakistan didn't exist. So it's easy for people to pick on us. Pakistan this, Pakistan that. No matter where you go in the world, including within Pakistan, you will learn about how crap Pakistan is. How maybe it wasn't such a great idea, how maybe we're too, we're too extremist, or you know, 
I mean, some people say we're too liberal, uh, we're too we're too dumb, we're not good enough. If you're Pakistani, you're probably you know sort of related to terror, especially if you're religiously oriented, which some of you clearly are, and you must remain so if that's what you want to do. Pakistan versus everything else is a major conflict. Most of you are going to end up studying and working and living abroad at some point in your life. Most of you will face the choice of whether you want to live here and make a life here or whether you want to live abroad. And that constant, that, that constant conflict, the foundation of that conflict will be whether this place or not. So I, did, I, I promised I wouldn't tell you what to choose, but on this one I have a slight bias and I, I'd say choose this place every time. There is no place on the planet that offers more opportunity to do more good than this place. And the reason is that this place has unlimited potential and most of it is unrealized. So you guys could be, if you want to be the brain makers and the change makers, you guys could be the thing that taps this place's potential to help it reach it. Don't worry, don't be intimidated. Yeah, I mean, it's not, it's not great right now, but it's got great potential. And how do I know it's got great potential? No. Look at yourselves in the mirror and think about how awesome you are and think, Pakistan deserves not just 50 of you, Pakistan deserves 50 million of you, right? There are currently about 58 million kids between the ages of 5 and 16. Every one of them deserved the nutrition that you guys had, the parents that you guys had who were driving you, the schools and the teachers that you guys had, the internet, the water, clean water, mostly Nestle, whatever, all of the things that you've had, what was the fault of the kids that aren't in this room? that have no chance of being in this room. No fault, right? The way to build a place where all of you can be science nerds, all 50 million or 58 million, is by people like you committing to this place and not letting the conflict of this place be not good enough dissuade you from making it better. So conflict number one, you versus them. Conflict number two, Pakistan versus everything else. Third conflict is Islam and modernity. And somehow, uh, at least in my generation, I, I hear it's changing, but in my generation we were told that you can't be all Islamic and all modern at the same time. You either have to be medieval and Islamic or you have to be modern and something else. Whatever that word is, I'm not gonna, you, know, you guys have heard all the words. Uh, and in fact, any examination of history any reasonable examination of history shows that it's a complete lie. There's no, there's no conflict between, not just Islam, any religion. So whatever religion you're from, no religion is in conflict with modernity. In fact, modernity is the product of the inspiration and the motivation of people that belong to various religions over the centuries. So every, every advancement in humankind has taken place under some religious regime or the other. So religion is not necessarily, and I don't think ever necessarily, in conflict with modernity. Which brings us to the next major conflict. And that one is more difficult. <coughs> Rationality and reason versus faith. Now this isn't about religion, because faith is about much more than religion. Um, faith is about having some sort of a deal or some sort of a relationship with what you can't see. And rationality and reason is that you have to be able to link things together and, and see them, touch them, feel them, or understand them. And faith is being comfortable with not understanding something. One of the hardest things for the smartest kids in class, especially the science nerds, is comfort with a lack of comprehension. And we just saw that in the previous in the previous session, you know, because you're like, I mean, lo lots of you, right? You were like, well, what about this? No, but then what about that? <coughs> and, and that, that spirit, so here's the challenge. This, that spirit of inquiry is why you're all here. Because at some point when you're really little, somebody helped spark that, and so that's why you studied a bit harder, applied whatever gray cells you had a little bit better, and you got to understand things better than anybody else because you kept asking. So. The conflict is asking questions versus asking so many questions that nothing makes sense anymore. 
And I definitely don't know the answer to where to stop there, but I know that there's a balance to be achieved. And if you run constantly chasing an explanation for everything and a comfort level with what you don't, uh, or, or sort of comfort only in knowing and understanding stuff, you'll never get there because nobody can understand everything ever. In fact, that might be the basis of science in its very sort of essence. So don't let something that you don't understand tear you apart. Let it, you have to develop some degree of comfort with what you can't grasp, with what you can't comprehend. Um, and then the final sort of conflict, as I said there was five, the final conflict is uh, more personal, but it emanates from that same one, which is your feels versus your things. Because as you grow, I mean, you're at the stage in life, most of you, where you're going to start to be allowed to make decisions on your own. And whether your parents allow you or not, you're still making decisions on your own. You're making social decisions about what websites you go to and what websites you don't. You're making social decisions about who you talk to, both online and in real life, and who you don't. You're making monetary decisions in terms of where you're spending your money in the canteen all the time. As, as life goes on, you'll have more money and you'll have a wider array of decisions. At each of these points, decisions, and I haven't gone into the whole range of them, but all of the decisions that you make are, you have a choice of allowing your mind to totally dominate each decision, or your heart, or what I call feels, or you can decide that you'll choose some things based on reason and linear logic, and you'll choose some things based on how you feel. Or you can make the decision that in everything that you decide, you will allow for a quantum of reason and a quantum of stuff that you don't understand, stuff that you just feel because you just feel it. And that if you feel something, even if it's the wrong thing to feel by any definition, again, you al allow your imaginations to, to explore that, Whatever you feel has legitimacy only in so far as because you feel it, it's, it, it exists, and so you have to deal with it. The smartest kids have a lot of trouble with stuff they don't understand and feel it, because those are things you don't understand. So I'm saying, don't let that conflict tear you apart. I'm not saying there's an easy solution. I don't have a pill, and, and nobody has a pill that, that can solve it. Uh, there's, there's, these, are, these are the things you have to grapple with. Like I said, you won't have trouble understanding your physics lesson, but you might have trouble understanding how you feel about the person that, you know, is looking at you funny or, you know, I mean, again, you're old enough to understand where I'm going with this. So, these conflicts are things you have to manage. There, there's, no, there's no answer. Each one of you will have your own answer. Some of you will go in one direction and end up being coders for Citibank. And some of you will go in another direction and spend a lifetime in a lab doing experiments and maybe not succeeding. But whatever path you choose, own each node in the journey and own it by being conscious of these conflicts and being comfortable in resolving them because that's the power, that's the agency of being privileged, of having a brain and of having a, a top-notch education. Key skills that uh, a lot of really smart kids don't get at school or even in university, but they, that you have to develop anyway. Uh, so I have five of these as well. So the five conflicts we talked about, now you have five key skills that I think, if you have the time and the energy and the effort, you should, you should invest in thinking about these skill sets. Because as I said before, being smart and getting good grades is not gonna be the primary challenge in your life. So, skill number one is grit. Anybody want to tell me what grit is? Independence? No. I mean, kind of, but not, not just in you. Okay, maybe a little bit. Okay, that's, yeah, perseverance is closer. Toughness. Toughness, okay, I like that. Getting up and moving on. There you go. Have you been in this before? No. So it's actually, yeah, so it's, go ahead. Having more difficulty solving your problems. Yeah, so I think it's all of those things, right? Grit is the ability to bear down and get on with it, right? Because you'll have failure in life. You, you 
probably all the kind of kids who get really upset when you get a 99. So <laughs> we'll be getting over it, right? <laughs> I don't know how nurses think these days, but that's the way it was when I was a student. Um, but no, sometimes you get like a 72. Is that, is that failure for you? No? Good, I'm glad to hear that. Okay, there you go. So, no, but grit is the yeah. ability and to, take time, yeah. to take that on the chin and to keep moving on. It doesn't mean that you become immune to how failure makes you feel. It means that you don't allow failure to slow you down to paralyze you, to trap you in a feeling of inadequacy, but actually to break free and to keep going. Because damn it, I can't, and I will. So that's grit. And for some reason, there's no course on grit in primary school, middle school, I, I don't understand the education system, but they don't teach you grit. Empathy is the second key skill or talent or ability that you need to develop. I'm not going to do a guessing thing with empathy. Empathy is really simple. It's me transferring my head and my heart into this man for, for five seconds before <laughs> reacting to him. Empathy is just being the other person, or being the other group, or being the other nation, or being the other race, or the other religion, or the other profession, or the other side of the classroom, or the other side of the income divide, or anything that is different from you. Empathy is the ability to become that in your head for a few seconds. And not just in your head, but also in your heart. So it doesn't mean, empathy doesn't mean that you agree with everything that everyone's saying, right? So if the PPP is saying something about sin, you don't have to agree with the PPP's entire agenda. You don't even have to agree with the specific thing PPP is saying. Maybe PPP is saying sin doesn't get enough money, right? Maybe you don't even agree with that, but you are able to convert yourself into a PPP Jala for that one second, only to understand how that guy feels, or that lady feels, about that issue. So empathy is not accepting the other party's viewpoint. And that's really important. A lot of people think empathy is just accepting what everybody's saying and having no backbone. That's not at all what empathy is. Empathy is standing firm in, in terms of what you believe and what you know, but being able to understand and acknowledge that there are other viewpoints and other places people are coming from. And the very same point in the universe could mean two completely different things to two completely different sets of eyes. So empathy is about the ability to acknowledge that without necessarily embracing it. Grit and empathy. The third is confidence. <clears throat> the smartest kids that I went to school with had one killer flaw, and it was that they couldn't talk like I could. Of course, I didn't. I wasn't born talking the way that I can. When I was a, when I was younger, like when I was in, I don't know, grade four and five and six and seven, I was bullied. Maybe I was beaten up a few times. Maybe I was picked on, and that helped me develop a little bit of a thick skin and helped me develop some grit and then. Nowadays, it's very different, because nowadays, the beating up leads to really bad injuries, and the bullying is cyberbullying, and it's online, and it's brutal, right? So I would never recommend, and I would never want a kid to go through that in today's day and age. So that's not the path to confidence, which means you have to figure out a different path to developing confidence. But no matter what happens, if you don't have confidence, you're really going to struggle, no matter how smart you are, no matter how much empathy you have. I mean, maybe you can get by because of grit, but, but you still need to be confident. So where does confidence come from? There's only one answer to this one, so I... Maybe from accepting what you are. From inside. From inside. It's, it's, confidence is basically an acknowledgement that you are you. Nothing, it's, it's not complicated. It doesn't mean that you're good or better or better looking or smarter or that your you know, hijab is the right color or your joggers are you know, brand new. That doesn't matter for shit. What matters is that you acknowledge that you are you. And that's a starting point for confidence. And then you can build upwards or sideways or whichever direction you want to go. But you have to acknowledge that you are you. And so without confidence, it becomes very difficult to apply all of the gifts and the tools that Alamia has given you. The fourth skill that they don't teach 
and again, it's shocking to me that they don't, is articulation. And articulation is not speaking well alone. It's also writing well. And articulation is not just writing a letter well, or writing a thank you note, or giving a speech. Articulation is also every single Facebook post, every single Twitter post, every Snapchat, I don't even know what you call it, a Snapchat? Yeah, like yeah, a, snap. a snap. And of course, articulation nowadays is also, <laughs> right, Instagram? How many, how many of you don't have Instagram accounts? Really? Why not? Parents don't allow it? We don't want. You don't want? Fantastic. Never felt like it. Fantastic. But there's a lot of pressure, and I'm amazed that there's some kids that still don't have it. A lot of pressure to have Twitter, Facebook, Insta, Snap. So, all this pressure to have this means that you have to learn how to articulate yourself. And you have to articulate yourself in all these forums. And all of these different virtual and real spaces in which you articulate yourself are you. I, this is something I have to actually give, when I give lectures to older people, I have to explain, I think you guys are probably smarter about digital identity than, than my generation is. But when it's all these old uncles and everything, and I know I'm an old uncle, but I'm talking about really old uncles, I have to actually explain to them, uncle, you cannot give galia and fakey galia and mean, be, mean or baby galia on your Twitter account, you are a well-respected senior person. Your grandkids are watching you. This is not like we're not. This is not like a private closed chat. And then, oh, so my grandson can read this. I was like, the whole world can read it. And he's like, oh, oh, oh. And then they go and delete their Twitter account. So, hopefully, you guys don't have that problem. You understand that your your Facebook, your a, a, it's permanent, and it's there for like all. I mean for conceivable sort of, you know, duration of time. And B, once it's out there, you, you can't control it, you can't ask Facebook to delete it on your behalf. Um, why are most abusive languages based on women? Well, we'll come to that, that that's, we'll come to that, that's coming. Did I, did I use an abusive word? No, I'm just asking if No, because it, I, I might have, and sometimes I forget. It's yeah, it's, well, so, so I think uh, of all the different conflicts, there's a special, like there's a special category because each one of those conflicts is much more exacerbated for women. And if you're a decent guy who has a mother, sister, daughter, or is just basically a basic human being, you will develop the ability to be conscious of the battle that women and girls have to fight to get anywhere near the same level of access and freedom and mobility that boys get without asking for it. But, but we'll come to that separately, you know, maybe we, maybe we can spend a bit more time. Articulation is in every fora, and good writing and good speaking comes from clear thinking. So if your ideas aren't coherent, it doesn't matter how many notes you have, you won't be able to pull this off. So you have to have a very, very clear set of ideas about what you want to communicate, and why you want to communicate before you start communicating. In the digital age, it seems that there's a big premium on just talking, which is why you see so much nonsense, it's just garbage constantly on TV, on Twitter. I mean, I'm guilty as well. On Twitter, on Facebook, on Insta. Who gives a shit what you ate for breakfast? <laughs> just, you know, especially for serious people like you. Except, you know what? Allow yourself to be kids, allow yourself to be human, and, and, and do indulge in some nonsense. Because the, no, no, because the nonsense will help you figure out how to articulate yourself. You're not supposed to be perfect from, from, from right now onwards. In fact, you'll never actually be perfect. So go ahead and make some mistakes. Don't make big ones, make small ones. But remember, people are watching, and you're learning, or you should be learning every step of the way. So articulation is the art of learning how to communicate based on how clearly you think. So the more clear you are up here, the better it's gonna come out off the tongue and onto the paper or the screen or whatever you use. The final skill that they don't teach, 
and this really offends me that we don't do this in Pakistan, is uh, something called yateen. So I mentioned faith earlier. So there's a thing called yateen and there's a thing called iman. And there seems to be a lot of emphasis on iman. Right? But not so much on yateen. Yateen is belief. Iman is faith. Faith is, you know, having some degree of comfort with what we don't know and what we don't understand. But Yaqeen is the next level. And it's, uh, there's a, so, so my bias, and this won't work for all of you, but my bias is spirituality. You can't have Yaqeen unless you have that bias. Now what is Yaqeen? What am I talking about when I say Yaqeen? You look skeptical. Yeah. What is Yaqeen? Or the belief that God is always with you. Sure. I mean, yes. Not sure. <laughs> but but I'm looking for something a little bit different. Anyone? Faith, faith is something that you have on yourself that I can do this. I I will do this. I have this much power. I I have this ability to achieve this thing. Okay. So. What about yaqeen? How is yaqeen different? Yaqeen uh, is a belief like I, uh, there is this belief that sunlight is from the east to the west. Uh, I'm going to stop you there. So I'm going to, uh, it's a good try, but I'm, I'm going to correct that. It's a little bit different in, in my understanding. I guess Yaqeen is like a belief where you don't think of the pros and cons and you just follow it or you just believe in it. Mm, I'm not liking that either. Yaqeen is understanding you will not acknowledge everything, but belief is to. Uh, uh, is to, un is to uh, uh, understand within yourself that the answers that you have been given are actually true. Okay, that's closer. And now it's getting more complicated. So you haven't spoken. Go ahead. Belief involves a, a, a small aspect of rationality as well. And it's it can be really about anything from um, an ideology you believe in to believing in yourself, as he said, that you can do something. Whereas faith is less logical and less <coughs> rational. So I think it's actually, I mean, that's, that's good, but, uh, so thank you for saying that. I think it's actually the other way around. I think belief is this conviction in stuff. And when I say stuff, it could be anything. Because there's, you know, how many of you are there? 35? 40? 43. 43. There's 43 of you, there'll be different levels of, you know, different levels of what you believe in, and, and different versions as well, right? So without going into sort of specifically what it is, but yaqeen is the conviction this is definitely, this is definitely dot, dot, dot. And faith is kind of a little calmer. Faith, uh, neither faith nor your thing can be taught. But if you want to be uh, Abdul Salam level successful, or uh, Bill Gates level successful, or Steve Jobs level successful, or Qaidi Azam level successful, it isn't just faith that will get you there. Uh, Faith is vital, but you have to evolve or graduate that, that, that comfort level with not knowing, with almost a conviction that actually what you don't know is taken care of, that there's, that there's something beyond yourself, and that system is, is going to do whatever it is that you need it to do. Ultimately, Yaqeen is more about your ability to process confidence and grit and articulation into yourself and through yourself. So when I say Yaqeen, it's really ultimately about, for me, and this, again, you, you choose your own language, but for me, my Yaqeen is based on Allah has made me, and he has given me this voice, and he has given me so much good training, and he has given me so much love, and this whole package is made from any reason. It will be something that will be its purpose. And I believe that I have to fulfill this purpose. What is the purpose? It's very specific. I can share with you sort of privately. You know, I think this country is my purpose. I think this country is... I think this country is my purpose. I think this country is so much better than anyone gives it credit for. Even as it is. Just as it is. Like, yeah, we all complain about, you know, the traffic and the politicians and some of us complain about the army judges, whatever, but, but really, just as it is, it's so perfect, because this is the country where we're all sitting here in this great university, and where you guys all seem to have gotten just a fine education. 
I don't, I don't understand why you guys are moaning and cribbing about Pakistan. This is the greatest country on earth for you guys. And if it can be this good for you, then it should be this good for everybody else. And so my yaqeen is that, that we're, gonna, we're gonna make it happen, inshallah. Now, of course, that yaqeen is based on a faith because obviously it's irrational because there's 220 million people and we know that your type is really, really small. And we know that when you're trying to distribute stuff, people fight back. So all the rationality tells us is a better than But all the faith and the yaqeen tells us is a better definitely hold up. Or, at least in my case, they can, I'm going to make some room. I'm going to do stuff that helps us get there. And maybe that stuff is scientific, through, through teaching kids science. Maybe that stuff is through building buildings. Maybe it's through developing a real estate sort of facility. Maybe it's through selling soap. People are cleaner. Like, there's no, there's no bar on how you're going to contribute. And I think one of the biggest challenges, and I'll go back to right at the start, what I said to you was that there is a set model. Medical or engineering. Either you're a doctor or you're an engineer, otherwise you're crap. And that's how we ended up with the country that we have. So that clearly wasn't very smart, right? Because a lot of smart people ended up doing dumb shit, like being doctors. <laughs> right? Please don't, <laughs> please make good decisions. If okay, some of you want to be doctors, then go out and discover a cure for cancer. You know, just don't, don't settle for average. And I think the, the, the belief in, in not being average comes from this, this idea of yaqeen that I'm saying. That, you know, otherwise, TK, I mean, you guys are significantly above average. But I mean, really, you know, the smartest kids at Stanford versus you guys, I think it's like, you know, needs beats. And I think they might win, right? Or the smartest group of Pakistanis in the world versus the smartest group of Russians. They will kick your ass at math, right? So, so what I'm saying is everybody else is coming correct as well. They're, they're, coming, to, they're coming to play, right? The Indians, oh, they're coming to play, right? And the Russians and the Chinese, and, I mean, the Chinese are all over us right now. Everybody's coming to play. So the thing that makes you special is not how good you are at math, because there's somebody out there that's better than probably the Russians. Right? He probably doesn't like you. So, any Russians in the room? <laughs> so you have to bring something special. And to me, that, that special thing is being from here. And, uh, and being from here is, doesn't mean just one thing. Uh, so again, to go back to the beginning, there are some of you that are from Abdabad and from Gujarabala, and from other places in the country. And I always say that if you're from an ethnic minority or a geographic visible minority, that is, if you're not from Islamabad, Prindi, Lahore, or Karachi, you have double the responsibility. You don't get to sulk that your people or your areas are ignored. There's politicians to do that for you. You get to do what you need to do to make sure that every damn STEM school is full of people from Aftabad. You're the one from Aftabad? Yeah. You have a responsibility. This place better be full of Aftabadis. And and uh, yeah. yeah, bring the Azaribas here. You speak Pashto. You make sure that there's Pashto instructors here because she can't get away without having it. That's how many Pakhtuns. Sure, but but that's how many Pakhtuns have to be here. Not now, not five years from now, maybe ten years from now, but that's on your shoulders. You don't get to complain, right? You are the ones that actually deliver. And similarly, for every every group that feels all of it. So the beautiful thing about Pakistan is. There's very few people who don't feel marginalized. Everybody's like, <laughs> My family's from Karachi. And so, so but, but it's not funny, because it's real. Those feelings are real. Those people are real people. And, and, and they're, not, they're not playing. They're not making it up. Why would somebody, think about it, why would somebody just get up and start complaining to Marisa Diyatiyo? Something has happened, right? You don't get it because Tumarisa Diyatiyo, but that doesn't mean you get to marginalize that person. So the solution for you guys, and I wouldn't give this lecture on the street, right? This is a special smart group of people. The solution for you guys is not complaining, it's actually changing the facts on the ground that you're complaining about. 
So if your people tell you, you create the space to transform that reality into a different one. And I think that you guys have that ability and that power. And we didn't. We weren't as smart. We weren't as brilliant. We, we didn't grow up in the digital age. We didn't have the STEM school. We didn't have the great Nada, uh, Nida Atad or rocket scientists. I mean, I was sitting there thinking, holy shit, there's a rocket scientist, like a nuclear guy, like within eight feet of me. I was thinking about radiation and stuff. Because I was down there. <laughs> but, but, but you guys have all of these great things happening for you. You're from this amazing place with the best food in the world. You have a responsibility to have faith in yourself, to believe that you actually are going to make some sort of a difference, and to do whatever you need to do, and all along the way, be aware of those conflicts and those choices that you're having to make. And when it's overwhelming and it's really difficult, you have a responsibility to reach out to someone. Maybe Nida, maybe others in your life. But don't let all this pressure that I've put on you get you down. Uh, I think one of the biggest things we don't talk about is mental health, and I, I made a specific point uh, while coming here to talk about mental health. Uh, it is really, really difficult to be 16 uh, and alive. How many 16-year-olds? 17? 14? Really? Which one is the third? Yeah. Three of them. I mean, I cannot imagine how difficult it is to be you guys. Because here's a guy, 23 years old, who's barking sort of orders about yapin and articulation, and you're thinking, my, my hormones, <laughs> my Instagram, right? so it's, it's difficult, it's difficult, and, and it's not, sometimes it's not funny, sometimes it's very sad, and it's very upsetting, and I think that, you know, we don't have the kind of facilities to help people through the tough times that we should, not just kids, but even adults, we have a real crisis in this country, where, where people are not getting the help that they need, you have to reach out, and it isn't always easy because it takes a lot of confidence. That's why I talked about confidence. The, this confidence that I have, this is the easy part. You know what's harder? is for me to be able to acknowledge that there might be some difficulties in my life. For me to reach out to someone and say, man, I can't figure it out, I need some help. That takes real confidence. That makes a real man or a real woman not pretending that you have it figured out, because nobody can have it all figured out. And again, the pressures on you guys, totally different from the pressures that Doc Saab or myself or Nida grew up with. Nida's much younger than both of us, but uh -huh. I thought Trust I'd throw that in there. No, so there was no Facebook. <laughs> exactly. Life was easier. Much easier. So, so, so reach out, uh, and a lot of you will come from families that, that aren't super sophisticated when it comes to mental health issues or, or, or just being helpful. A lot of you will have families that are actually more, more problematic because they put more pressure on you. When you go to them, they'll be like, damn it, you do it, right? So, so then you reach out elsewhere. School, I think the STEM thing is great because I think it gives you a new channel to engage with through Nida and, and uh, through Dr. Atul Sama and the whole range of speakers that have come here. Expect a lot from yourself, but only within the context of knowing that you have limitations. Final point on women. Uh, women are smarter than men. We all know that. Anybody want to contest that? <laughs> Good, because you're out. Do you worry, I, do. I don't talk to people do who don't like basic math. Basic science, man. Look at all the numbers globally. Women are smarter than men. Look at, look at, look at humankind's history. Men are the ones that have destroyed it. Women are the ones that built it. Uh, but on a serious note, that was serious too, but on a serious note, <laughs> The, I'm not talking to the women, I'm talking to the men in the room, or the young men in the room. You have a responsibility, you have a responsibility to comprehend and acknowledge that the level playing field that we all pretend exists does not exist, especially in our context. And there's nothing wrong with our religion, and there's nothing wrong with Pakhtun Wadi, and there's nothing wrong with our culture. So don't let anybody blame our culture. The problem of misogyny and of an un un uneven playing field is a human problem. It's the same in India, it's the same in America, it's the same in the UK. Don't let anybody tell you it's Pakistanis or Islam or any kind of cultural thing. It's, it's a human thing. And because it's a human thing, it shouldn't be too hard to understand. 
there is uh, several thousand years of history that have built up a situation in which mobility and freedom and expression, all of those things are more difficult depending on what gender you are. So you have a responsibility not only to take care of yourself, but to make sure that you are not getting in the way. Women don't need your help. Women, you, know, you don't need to be carrying women. But you have to not be the guy that's getting in the way. We were actually having this conversation uh, half an hour, 20 minutes before uh, we came in. I was telling all the, these guys that good you're being gentlemen and not letting the girls take the heavy load of the, while they were doing the experiment, but let them make their mistakes. Let them carry their load and they might prove you otherwise. Yeah. This is hard stuff, even for people who seem like they have it figured out, like me. These are hard things to understand. We're at a develop, developmental arc in human history where everything is changing all the time really fast. I guess maybe hopefully you guys are native to these changes and, and the pace of changes, so hopefully you'll be more sophisticated in how you deal with them. But my final point is this. Be very, very hard on yourself. And don't be too hard on yourself. May Allah uh, make you successful in everything that you attempt, and may you always be happy, inshallah. Thanks for listening. Uh, sir, as Ma'am Nida has already told us about your work in educational field, uh, so I, as you have already mentioned five points, generalized and abstract points, but I want to uh, uh, know your analysis on the current education system of Pakistan and where, which things can be improved and where we have to go and how much is that distance. I get paid a lot of money to answer that question. <laughs> So I think we have a very divided uh, country and society. Some people, uh, how many kids attended a purely government school for more than five years of their life? No one? So, so that's one answer, right? All the smart kids that can speak English, that can do math, that can talk to a quantum physicist or a nuclear physicist, that you know come to STEM school, they all go to private schools. How many Veganites? Uh, LGS. You see, you see what I'm doing. I could probably go through about eight schools and I'll cover all of you. Burn Hall. So the point being, uh, if you break up the, the, the broad divide is 65 to 35%. 65% of all Pakistani kids are going to a government school, and about 48% of all Pakistani kids are going to no kind of school. So you really make up the very smallest band. So the answer question, we have a deeply uh, unequal and divided system, and it's complicated in how divided it is, because there's different kinds of private schools. There's low, low-cost private schools, that are 500 rupees a month and below. There's low-cost private schools that are between 500 and maybe 2,500 a month. Then there's what we call <coughs> the, the, the elite private schools that everything above 2,500 rupees per month. And within that, there's wide variance in quality. Sometimes you might be getting a better quality education at 1,500 a month than you do at 4,000 a month. We don't know. Why don't we know? Because nobody measures it. Why don't we measure it? Because the government has abandoned our, our children. So neither the government schools are giving a good enough education, nor do we know which of the private schools are actually doing a great job. And as you advance further and further, the reason so many of you, the reason so many of you uh, are going to end up abroad is because our own research facilities, our R&D, our ability to attract the best talent, both as professors and researchers and as <coughs> students, is very limited. 
जो जो माँ बाप परेशान होते हैं कि बच्चा बाहर जाके खराब हो जाएगा वो और वो ब्रिलियंट बच्चे होते हैं वो लाम जो चिया के चले जाते हैं वरना यू नो द ब्राइटेस्ट ऑफ द ब्राइट एंड द वंस दैट कैन अफोर्ड इट दे एंड अप गोइंग टू स्टैंडफोर्ड एंड आई थिंक सो आई थिंक वी हैव अ बिग वी हैव अ बिग डिस्टिंक्शन इन क्वालिटी द गवर्नमेंट हैज नॉट पेड अटेंशन टू इट द वे दैट इट शुड ओवर टाइम आई थिंक थिंग्स माइट गेट बेटर बिकॉज़ देयर इज मोर एंड मोर अटेंशन बीइंग पेड टू दीस इश्यूज आई वाज पार्ट ऑफ दैट एफर्ट विद अलिफ एलान बट देयर सो मेनी अदर पीपल दैट आर डूइंग देयर बेट um and uh i would say don't worry about solving i mean if you can solve the education crisis please do but from my vantage point it might be a few years before we before we solve it it's not going to get solved immediately so in the meantime i would say focus on your education and last off Is there certain criteria to judge what success really is? No, I think it varies for different people. Uh, sometimes I think success is my ability to relive, you know, moments of in, of my Hajj in terms of how good my my prayer is going. Sometimes I think success is, uh, you know, how expensive the new pair of pants that I bought were and how nice they feel when I wear them. Uh, sometimes success is the way my mother looks at me. Sometimes success is the way I feel during the national anthem at some function. Because I, I don't know about you guys, but I still get these weird goosebumps. I just, I just like I feel like going nuts, you know. And I feel like that must mean something. So success at different points in time uh, will mean different things. Uh, success, you should define success for yourself in terms of how you, you you see it. But don't be selfish about it. That us and them doesn't mean you choose yourself every time. It means being able to integrate what society and and. Uh, different norms expect from you whether it's religious norms or cultural uh, all of these things your culture your religion your traditions your customs some of them are crap right we know this especially in terms of gender or in terms of limiting people's options but a lot of them have real value even the crap ones because they actually help organize society and they maintain an order so you got to think about which one which taboos and which which rules you want to break and which ones you want to keep and again it'll be a mix there won't be a formula ke har dafa ye wala rule todna hai और इससे दुनिया बेहतर हो जाएगी एंड यू हैव टू मेक दोस चॉइसेस योरसेल्फ सो यू नो हाउ वी टॉक अबाउट एवरी um आई थिंक दैट अ बिग प्रॉब्लम इज दैट पीपल नाउ दे डोंट वांट टू लिसन टू ईच अदर और डोंट इवन वांट टू अंडरस्टैंड द अदर पर्सपेक्टिव एंड यू नो द फिनोमेना ऑफ सेलिब्रेटिंग द डिफरेंसेस इज रियली मिसिंग सो हाउ डू यू थिंक दैट कुड बी मेड बेटर इन आवर कम्युनिटी आई सो आई थिंक इन द इन द शॉर्ट टर्म आई डोंट थिंक इट विल गेट बेटर आई थिंक इट विल गेट वर्स बिकॉज़ देयर इज अ technology is fueling difference so uh, you know when we were growing up you couldn't just be some some guy out the street starts tweeting and then it gets goes viral and suddenly you have 800 new followers or 1000 or 100000 followers i mean but we live in a world where kim kardashian and kanye west have more followers than any scientist on the planet in fact all the scientists on the planet combined don't have as many followers as Justin Bieber it's it, you know so so it's very difficult to uh bring people together when the ability to tear people apart is rewarded with arguments and likes the more nasty something is the, the more biting and sharp it is the more arguments and likes and faves it gets right and so in this kind of a world it's a real challenge to to bring people together which is why it's worth doing even more we should have even more conviction so should we follow a passion or should we follow scope i don't know the difference between the two explain scope uh, scope hai ek pehla pehla scope hai abhi jata hai but usme engineering karta hai like job mein business karta hai aur agar mujhe medical ka karna hai to medical ki taraf jana chahiye ya engineering ki taraf kya mujhe dekh sakte hai scope so that's a good question uh yours i think That's a difficult question. So let me answer it like this. I think the the ideal situation is that you always follow your passion. But the reality is that not every passion is worth following. And in the real world, you don't have the luxury. I mean, I think do you know what a trust fund is? So a bunch of trust fund babies, you know, rich kids. Rich kids can follow their passion. But I I I grew up kind of reasonably middle class. I I I got to follow my passion alhamdulillah. But I also had to worry about how much I was making. As soon as I, I went to Lums, I was the first bachelor's class. I came out of college. I wanted to follow my passion, which was writing, so I joined Herald. But four months into my job, I realized that at the salary I was getting, 
9,872 rupees a month. I wouldn't be able to make ends meet in Karachi because my family was in uh, was in Islamabad. So I changed my job and I, and, I, and I moved. So was I following my passion? Kind of, but then I had to make a compromise because I had to look at, you know, jib could be taken. So I think you have to be practical, but I think if you have yaqeen and you have confidence, some people are lucky enough to convert their passion into a practical outcome. I, I feel like I've been that lucky and I know a lot of other people have, but that success is not guaranteed. You could have all the yaqeen and the confidence and the articulation and the empathy and the grit in the world, and you still end up sort of feeling really crappy on the 25th of the month when you run out of money. <laughs> As someone who who's on the verge of overcoming um, mental issues, that uh, umbrella term, and self-loathing, and I I I see. You get the point, right? If I don't look a certain way and I don't act a certain way, then I won't get what I want. So my 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 giving into society or my caving to society is defined by what I want to get out of society. So that so so I think you respect the outside environment, but you respect it to the extent of what you want to achieve through it, or using it, or for it. Does that make sense? So can we say that yaqeen comes from faith, and uh, yaqeen is actually a superlative degree of faith? I would say that. I didn't want to, but now that you said it. Because that, that creates degrees, and then there's like a competition. Mere paas faith in, mere paas yakin hai, A plus, you know, so, so you, don't, you don't want to, I don't want to do that. I mean, field of education and policy, what is your opinion on the recent verdict on private schools? I have very, uh, I have mixed views about this uh, verdict. The Chief Justice retires on the 17th, so ask me on the 18th. <laughs> okay. That's if that's all. Last one. The platform of Ali Bilan was retired on the 31st of August uh, after five and a half years of campaigning, because all great campaigns have a clear start date and a clear end date. <coughs> campaign's purpose was to bring education to the national discourse, to make people talk about it differently. I think we achieved that. Therefore, we shut shut it down. So currently. I'm trying to set up a think tank and uh, to do interesting work and explore interesting ideas, not just about education, but about health, about national security, about nutrition, all the different public policy challenges that Pakistan and other countries face. Yeah, about that. Great to meet you guys. All my prayers and best wishes for you all, and uh, good luck. Thank you so much.